Uh, I'm very uh, pleased to, to share the experience that we had in the northern part of uh, uh, Ethiopia. Uh, actually, uh, this is the uh, approach or the outline that I'm going to talk. I will give you a little bit on the uh, uh, characteristics of the, the, the region, which is uh, Tigray. The approach or the tools which have been used to uh, implement the uh, watershed uh, management, what are the progress made, benefits, uh, opportunities for upscaling, and some concluding uh, remarks like uh, on, the, on the experience that we uh, really see on the ground. Of course, uh, I think as you know, uh, Ethiopia is part of the Nile, and uh, especially the Tigray region is in the north, which is uh, indicated by the red point there. Uh, and then, of course, this part of the region is, uh, you know, uh, part of the highly uh, degraded environment. This is uh, the location of the Tigray region. It has a population of uh, over 4.4 uh, million. And topographically, over 70% of the area is uh, having an elevation greater than 1,500, and nearly 40% is about uh, greater than 2,000. Of course, it can proceed up to 2,800 meter above sea level. Well, uh, the major problem with this uh, region has been uh, the food security issue. I think uh, we all know about Ethiopia. We know uh, a lot, not in a positive, but in a negative aspect, which is related to drought, famine. So this is among the regions which has been completely degraded. And then, of course, still now, about 1.4 million, which is from this 4.4 is still food insecure, even now. Uh, so it has been uh, food insecure for a number of reasons. Uh, of course, land degradation. It has been uh, utilized for over uh, 2,000 years. Farming started uh, 2,000 years uh, and earlier. And then, of course, uh, the rainfall was very short, and it varies even every year. So even rainy season is variable, not only uh, uh, you know, locally, but also seasonally. The land size is very small. Often, it's less than 0 0.5 hectare. Of course, more than 60% of the farmers have quarter of a hectare. So with this small plot of land, less degraded, I mean, le highly degraded land, then, uh, of course, there was very limited, in some cases, uh, very limited irrigation there. So, a number of you know, efforts have been done to change the situation. So the approach which was used is uh, uh, two. One is using free labor, and the other one is by using what we call the productive safety net. This, so this free labor is every uh, abled person is expected to spend 20 up to 40, time, 40 days uh, a year for uh, uh, soil and water conservation the activities. And then, of course, this productive safety net, which used to be a food aid, was changed into this approach so that everybody who are not able to secure their own food will be involved in these activities. And then they will get uh, what you call the, the food which was being given them to, to, to them for free some years back. Now, how is it organized? Of course, there is a national, uh, uh, what you call manual, which is developed on soil and water conservation. So these different regions, they have their own, what you call the, uh, uh, the Bureau of Agriculture is in charge of that, in mobilizing. And then uh, they give training to the uh, lower level administrative body, which, which you call the Waradas. And the Waradas go to the, to the, uh, the sub-catchments. So, Every small catchment, the communities there, they will be involved in this soil and water conservation, which is a highly organized approach in, in a way. And different organizations are involved there, especially in the mobilization. You can imagine that somebody who is expected to spend 40 days a year, it's not easy to, 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 to mobilize, especially the farmers who don't know much about the benefits that they are going to get. So like farmer unions, women's associations, youth associations, schools, religious institutions, they were all involved in this uh, mobilization because it's not 
a matter of choice. It's a matter of survival, to be very honest. Either you have to change the landscape or you have to abandon it. So this is the choice which I think it was followed and uh, it worked really very well. So what progress has been made? We are not talking about small scale interventions. Like for example, from uh, this whole region, nearly 80% of the area is covered with these different uh, soil and water conservation measures. I think this is, as you can see, from the top up to the whole galleys is covered with this, with this type of effort and throughout the whole region. And uh, of course, uh, before 15 years, we were involved in a number of water development. You can't get water, either the shallow wells, the deep wells, whatever. It was completely dry. But now people are moving from the soil and water conservation effort into water harvesting. This, this, uh, the free lever now is for water harvesting to dig wells and so on now, which was never before. So uh, you can say that in Tigray, uh, we are very thankful to uh, all the countries which we have copied the technologies. All the technologies in Japan and in, in, in China, in India, uh, probably if we can get here also, we, we, could, we, could, we could take it, is introduced. The way how it's introduced is completely in a very irregular way, in a way. It's not like research-based, but it's mainly applied like, let's try it in the field, and then we see what's going to happen, if it's going to work or not. So you'll find all type of technologies over, I think over 80 different technologies are introduced in addition to existing indigenous technologies. So like the hillside terraces, storm burns, trench bands, check dams, even you know the normal designs that you check for example, you get for uh, the different technologies is now changed by the farmers because they know which one is going to work or which one is difficult for, for them to, to construct and so on. So I think there is a lot which is going on by the, by the, by the farmers themselves. So the uh, area closures, hillside stone terrace with trains, uh, stone bands, uh, these are some of the, the, the technologies which are, which are introduced. So you can imagine uh, the costs which is associated with uh, having this type of very, uh, very extensive uh, type of activities uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large scale. So the benefit that we, uh, we have, of course I'm very grateful with uh, Professor uh, Linder who, who made a presentation on the theoretical aspect, but the, the whole, effort of moving into this watershed management was based on theory. So the base was, if you do soil and water conservation, it has a positive effect. That was the, the premise behind the whole effort which was done integral. And it really worked. So if you see, for example, in this area, uh, almost the whole watershed is uh, conserved. And then you have a number of wells down there like hand dug wells, which are now used for irrigation. Every household has at least one well in his own garden or in his house, in, in his home. Uh, uh, and then, of course, they are producing quite uh, very, very good uh, output. Fertility of the soil improved. This is from even the farmers. This is a sandy area, which was never giving uh, quite uh, very good uh, output, but now, Flooding reduced and in some cases fully controlled. There is a very, very little runoff actually. And then of course, there is a reduced sedimentation. For example, from this uh, watershed as a small uh, catchment, the, uh, it's, it's almost zero flood. Everything is uh, infiltrating. And then down there, you have all these uh, uh, shallow wells which are now being is, uh, irrigated. This is a watershed. We are not, this is a small watershed, what we see here. But the whole catchment is completely conserved, which is actually uh, one of the uh, uh, very successful uh, catchments. And then groundwater has improved a lot. Now we are talking about groundwater irrigation. Groundwater irrigation is now getting uh, momentum. And then, of course, you have new springs which are coming. And then, of course, integrated with these springs is the gully 
treatment and of course uh, uh, the diversion of the flood. Uh, and productivity has improved up to threefold. We have made an inventory up to threefold per season. So per season we have up to threefold uh, uh, productivity which in increase. Biodiversity is regenerating. It's not, you know, the, uh, the previously uh, uh, hibernating, uh, uh, you know, biodiversity is coming. The climate, the microclimate is completely changing. As you can see, this is uh, a river which was completely dry. You have only water during the, the, uh, the rainy season, which is coming as a flood. But now you have all this now integrated with, with check dams, and this is diverted to, for, for irrigation. And then, of course, uh, here and there, you see uh, springs and uh, uh, even our dams. Some of the dams which were constructed before the conservation was made, they were being silted up. But now, many of the dams now which are under construction, we are sure that there will be little sedimentation or siltation of, the, uh, uh, of these reservoirs. Of course, one of the major achievements, I would say, is the attitude of the people is changing. People are really hopeless, and, um, uh, and uh, as we have been mentioning before, even the donors, the donors, they were so hopeless that they uh, not willing to, to invest on these watersheds. But now there is a, quite a very positive development uh, going on. And then, of course, from this northern part of especially Ethiopia, people used to migrate uh, to the Middle East. But now it's really uh, you know, uh, b better now. People are seeing hope in their environment that they, they could they could be, and then of course uh, the livelihood is improving a lot, really a lot, and then uh, some of them it's quite changing dramatically because some of them are having uh, building houses in urban areas, uh, buying cars, and you know you know it's completely changing, and then uh, what we see is the. Uh, Food security is highly linked with water security. We don't get that much problem in areas where they are water secured in terms of subsurface or uh, surface uh, water. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, old, uh, actually 60 years old uh, farmer uh, who, who was saying that uh, he feels that uh, he should have, he should have uh, been 30 years old because it's only 10 years since they became familiar with irrigation. So they feel that uh, you know, it's an it's a opportunity for the young generation because by then uh, they had uh, this uh, uh, well, less awareness and there was no uh, moisture in the, in the environment. And this is like the uh, real feeling of the, even the old uh, people there. Opportunities for upscaling. I think this northern part of Tigray, Ethiopia, is uh, one of the, I would say, the most drone prone on Earth. In Ethiopia, it's the top, but if it can work there, it will definitely work in other parts of Ethiopia and in other parts of the world. So this is like a very good uh, opportunity, we can say. The reason is because, like for example in Ethiopia, the remaining part is less degraded, and now we have the experience as well. Almost a 20 years trial and error uh, technology being introduced and so on in the north. And then of course, as a result of this, in the last two years specifically, there is a very massive soil water conservation in other parts of Ethiopia, almost taking the same approach and also the same similar technology which has been uh, uh, introduced. So people are now uh, moving to the north to get experience, even farmers. Farmers from other communities are able to, because before it was only the educated people or the op those who have the opportunity who are able to go to China, to India, or to other parts of the world to get these technologies. But now it's, uh, it's quite uh, an, an opportunity, I would say. So I think um, what I would uh, uh, make as a remark is, uh, despite you know, the number of challenges in the north, uh, this watershed management uh, is able to ensure food security. And then, of course, we are creating an environment which is resilient to climate. Because even we are able to, to see that during the driest season, 
the shallow wells are okay. The water table could reduce to some extent, but for sure there is enough moisture and also water to keep the, uh, the, the, the people in place, which was quite a very uh, risky condition before. And many of the soil and water conservation structures constructed in Tigray, we call them non-engineered. Like this check dam there, if you, if, you, if you ask this to an engineer, he will really spend maybe uh, you know, to, to a week to make the stability analysis, to, you know, but this is done by the farmers. As far as they are able to regulate the flood, to maintain it, I think it's really working. And then this has really ensured it's, uh, their sustainability. We are talking about at a large scale. So if you keep all the flood which is coming at every uh, uh, sec sect of the, the, the watershed, you don't need to go to the, to the whole uh, analysis of stability and so on and so on. So the farmers can really make that. You can see that the, the farmers are uh, given some training and then they are the ones who control, who, who, you know, who supervise, and then at the end who maintain and manage the, uh, the watersheds. And the third point, which I would really like to uh, uh, indicate everybody to think about, is really uh, the importance of the uh, 3R concept, which we have really proved that it works. And then maybe to revisit the definition of water harvesting. So uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you come to the normal scientific water harvesting definition, I don't think it's similar to what we have been doing there. So. Uh, it has to be a watershed-based uh, watershed in situ soil water conservation measure as an aspect of the whole water, sh water harvesting. If you don't do that, you are not going to, ha to, to have the final uh, output there. So I really uh, uh, agree that water is part of the soil, and it's when the soil is fully saturated that you have excess water that could be uh, harvested for uh, a number of purposes as you have we are able to prove from this part. This whole irrigation was never taught before. But now, after the whole upper watershed is completely treated, now we are talking about how to harvest it, how to manage it, how to irrigate it on irrigation management. So the whole topic is now changing from the uh, uh, upper watershed uh, management or conservation work into watershed and irrigation management there. And this is one of the, uh, uh, as you can see, this an area closure, where because of the closed uh, upper watershed, you have all the livestock which are now uh, uh, using all these uh, uh, you know, opportunities, like they cut, this is from, uh, by, by cutting and caring, the farmers are able to use the grass, and then you have downstream dams and reservoirs and hand dug wells, which is now used for, for irrigation. So the scale issue is really a very important in a way. So I think when you think about uh, 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 what you call investment, we should think of the whole challenge associated with it. If, if, if you ask somebody to invest on this type of effort, I doubt that it will, it will, it, it will be feasible at the beginning. So this is like a 20, 30 years effort, but now people can, uh, actually individual farmers are even, uh, investors are coming to irrigate at downstream areas now. But this was almost impossible some years back. And I think this is uh, the whole uh, uh, experience that we have in, in, the, in the north, and uh, thank you for your attention. make some remarks first. Um, being here in this Stockholm Water Week, I hear a lot of uh, stories about land degradation that you uh, face uh, tipping points, basically tipping points of no returns. And I think the Tigray uh, case, which is presented by you, Dr. Kifle, shows that an area that in the 80s was, well, it's basically the Volgeldov area, which was regarded as very much degraded and uh, international investors basically saw no opportunities 
to change the situation that with good investments and skills but knowing that it takes a lot of long time and a good clear vision that a degraded area can be regreened and uh, that new investments are taking place and that the innovations made are now also creating other positive loops of new innovations. Thank you very much to show that uh, story to us, that there are very good positive stories uh, around. <coughs> See, I said many questions <laughs> immediately. That was the first person, so I would like to ask you to just, uh, introduce yourself and uh, then take a question or remark. My name is uh I'm a Nigerian. I work with the Federal Ministry of Water Resources. Uh, my, 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 I have a comment and a question too. First of all, uh, what happens in this watershed impacts greatly on the Nile Basin as a whole. And I know that uh, the major source of sediments to the Nile is from this region. So are you collaborating with the barbarian countries like Sudan and Egypt? Because I know that that this government spends a lot of money to clear sediments coming from the region. That is one. And secondly, um, in terms of water availability, I'm also aware that with this program, you are going to have less water getting to the Nile. Um, how is you know, Sudan and you know, Egypt reacting to this? Because they are obviously trapping more water in Austria. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your. Uh question and remark. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kiepler to uh, repeat the question and remarks of this sir, for our international viewers. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, the two questions are, uh, one is uh, related to the, uh, uh, what happens with uh, the, the effect, the effect of the upstream conservation with regard to sediment and also probably availability of water to the, to the south, I mean to the, to the downstream users like Sudan and uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if, if you see hydrologically, there is quite, uh, you know, uh, a very enormous amount of water, which we have on average is like, for example, in this region is about 700 millimeter. So the, the, the flood, which is coming around the rivers, the majority is coming al almost in the form of a base flow, not, not in, a, in a complete sheet or uh, the surface runoff, but in the, in, the, in the form of a base flow. So um, we try to model that even the base flow, which is going to Sudan, has improved. I think if there are some uh, professors here from, from Sudan, they could really help us because they are able to irrigate now, even in the dry season, because of the base flow, which is coming, a uh, little bit delayed as compared to the runoff which used to to pass during the uh, rainfall season in our case. So our rivers, there is a lag time now for the, for, for the flow to the rivers. Otherwise, some of I mean, like the, the rivers, the discharge has improved, not during the rain season, but especially after, after the, uh, the, the, the rain season. So there is a very positive effect on the downstream users. We cannot contain all the base flow, uh, which is going to the downstream uh, part of the, uh, you know, the watershed. Um, the same is true with, with the availability of water. The sediment trap, actually, sediment used to be a very negative aspect for the south, for, for the downstream region like Egypt and Sudan. They were investing a lot on dredging, but now this is going to reduce a lot. So I think the question is a very, very good, and the answer to that is we have to think like a same watershed. We are in one watershed. So we have to, we have to work together as one system. So you, you, you invest. <coughs> you invest. Like, for example, the Sudan and Egypt should really invest on the watershed treatment that we do in Ethiopia. I really uh, like the concept of the, the water credit. The water credit. I think it's a very, very good theory which could work in, in, our, in our case. But we are, we are, we are investing uh, ourselves now. So I, th I think it's very, very positive uh, in a way. Thank you very much. Uh, Khaled, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, should I reintroduce myself? 
I think uh, I ended my previous presentation with the, the phrase the proof of the pudding is in the eating I think you've just eaten my pudding yes. <laughs> I mean this is this kind of presentation makes me really happy when I see such a success story uh, I wasn't aware of this I, I know Ethiopia a little bit um, so that's, that's mainly a comment that uh, it's, it's, yeah, I really enjoyed it uh, I just have two questions or maybe also comments you said at some point that um, there was a shift from soil and water conservation to water harvesting. But then when you uh, mentioned all the benefits, actually they are much broader than, than just water harvesting, like increased soil fertility, less erosion, less sedimentation, and even you now mentioned the downstream effects. So again, I need this for my question, what are the downstream effects? Um, Within the WOCAT uh, project that I mentioned, and which was actually 20 years ago initiated by Professor Hans Wurm, who worked mm. a very long time in uh, Ethiopia, uh, we see water harvesting as one conservation group, one, one group of soil and water conservation. So you might turn it the other way around, but that's a matter of definition and semantics, probably. Um, you said that's maybe a question you tried out about 80 technologies taken from all over the world and if you say tried out do you mean really trial and error uh, because you said there was no scientific mm -hmm. basis to try them out again yeah i don't want to push our own projects too much but within WOCAT we have this entire database of as i said 450 technologies from all over the world which gives you all the details and all the conditions under which they are implemented and there's even a system now developed uh, under a project called DESIRE where WOCAT is used to uh, see what, uh, what technologies would be potentially uh, implemented so that your, your uh, trial and error is a, a bit more trial and a bit, a bit less error and uh, I don't know how many errors you had uh, apparently it was very successful but you see, because you're playing with, with uh, the farmers, they are investing in these technologies. So if they fail in a certain technology, that, that's a serious, serious thing for them. So that, yeah, I, I assume you also cover that risk to some extent. Mm -hmm. But that's an important thing. So, uh, uh, yeah, and the other question was indeed about uh, the, the downstream effects. And as you explained, uh, there's more subsurface flow, less sediments. So my neighbor here was suggesting <coughs> that Sudan should actually actually start paying Ethiopia yes. for the water stream, uh, water chat. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know whether these were questions or comments. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I don't want you to raise any political issues. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, to, to, I think some of the, uh, the, the points are like, you know, comments, we take them because uh, they are uh, all very constructive. Um, just to, to the questions, uh, we have introduced about uh, actually uh, nearly more than 80 different uh, technologies. Uh, so the question is, were they really tried or not? Uh, if you see the way how the technologies were introduced in Ethiopia, uh, the academia is behind the introduction of the technologies, not at the forefront. So mostly it's the experts or the decision makers who visit you know, different countries and they say, now you have to try this. So I think uh, you know, the research, the development part is lagging behind. So the main push was from the decision makers, from the practitioners who are trying to, to introduce the different technologies, and uh, uh, it was not based on experiment. And uh, if you ask, like, oh, let's try it for the three, four years, then they, they will say, there is no time to wait to experiment one technology for some years. So they were saying, introduce it, then those which are successful, the farmers will take it. And actually, that was, that really worked. So. Now the effectiveness of the different technologies which are introduced is not known. But 
every technology which is working somewhere is tried to be introduced. And uh, I think there is a, a quite a big uh, research issue that uh, we could work on which one is more effective as compared to the different technologies which were uh, introduced there. Uh, the shift from uh, soil water conservation to water harvesting, uh, you know, before 15 years, even the, the, the groundwater wells that we were drilling were dry. And if you get some water, it can be only yielding for a very short time. Otherwise, because there is no recharge, it dries. And the quality was not good because of the high total dissolved solids there. But now, because of the conservation there, we are moving to, uh, you know, everybody is talking about water harvesting. 15 years ago, nobody could say water harvesting because there is nothing to harvest. It was more like to, you know, to, to, to conserve, you know, the... Um, so even the way how it was implemented is, I think I have to mention that, normally to convince the farmer is the most difficult. So initially, the government said, OK, let's start normally. You start the watershed treatment from the upper watershed. And then you go down. Then the government said, no, if we do that, the farmers will not accept it because it will not, it will not be you know, beneficial to them immediately. So what they said was, let's start it in the farm. So the method, the approach is wrong. So the conservation started from the farmlands. And then they started you know, observing a difference between the productivity before the conservation and after, because it's done in the, in the farm, like they, they put some soil bands and so on within the farm areas. Farmers started to observe that, okay, this is better. So they were shifting more from the cultivated area into the uncultivated area. Now, the watershed management in the farmland is done by the individual farmers themselves. The upper watershed is done by the communities. So even the approach sometimes, you know, you, you, you introduce it in the wrong way, deliberately, so that you convince people. Now everybody, every farmer knows that what you do in the upper watershed will benefit the, down, the, down, the downstream uh, 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 users. Uh, the downstream effect, uh, honestly, uh, we have not yet quantified it everything, but for sure, with regard to the availability of water and sediment, it's positive. But I would say it's more than that. Because it's like, if you can work together as one watershed, then if the upstream watershed is contributing some negative aspect to the downstream, then we can come to the, to the uh, green water credit concept. So we pay the upstream uh, people or community so that the downstream will not would not have a negative aspect. Honestly, nobody is really interested to, to harm the downstream users like Sudan and Egypt, at least in the Ethiopian perspective now. But we need to get to work together so that there will be a limit where what we can share uh, uh, in, in, in what aspect. But I think the whole uh, direction is in a way really very, very uh, positive. <laughs>